we have a very good uh, program lined up. So we'll, without anything, we'll start first with the Dr. Vaishali. Uh, uh, please go ahead. And I think the timing is 15 minutes, Vaishali, for you. Vaishali, you have to unmute. Vaishali, you have to unmute. Sorry for that. I was not able to unmute myself. And are my slides visible on screen? Yes. Perfect. So thank you, Namrita, ma'am, Rajesh, sir, and uh, everyone at AIOS for this opportunity. And we have all, I mean, been enjoying for the last 18 months plus these webinars. And really, it gives us so much to learn from the comfort of our own uh, clinic or home or wherever you are. So today, I'll be trying to touch upon this uh, important topic, which really is not related to a particular technology, but more about your technique and how we use whatever technology we have to understand what role does intraocular pressure play in cataract surgery. And we as a uh, group of consultants at Raghudipa Hospital do receive occasional research support grant from Alcon Laboratories. But I don't think this topic per se is anything to do with uh, any particular technology, generally speaking. Now, when we talk of cataract surgery or phaco emulsification, whether it's uh, flax or whether it's a manual phaco, basically we are dealing with uh, one form of ultrasonic or femtosecond laser, uh, which is energy. And the other form is how we actually remove that lens uh, and the cortical matter. Now there, whether you use a venturi or a peristaltic, basically it is the fluid, the flow of the fluid, which in most cases as cataract surgeons, we use peristaltic machines. And therefore we uh, use a combination of vacuum, aspiration flow rate and bottle height. And we need to understand that uh, whatever goes inside the eye in terms of the irrigation pressure through your IOP or bottle height is balanced or needs to be proportional to whatever comes out of the eye. So uh, why are we talking about intraocular pressure during surgery? Well, because what fluidic parameters we use, that is the specifically combination of the bottle height or the irrigation pressure that is coming in, either through a gravity-based system or through a pressurized or an active fluidic system, and how fast per minute or how much volume per minute are we losing by setting the aspiration flow rate, but also compensating for leakages that may happen through the incisions. So even if we do micro incision surgery or uh, one millimeter side port incisions, there is always some leak happening, which a lot of times may be more than what you might expect. Does it really matter? Why should we even be talking about these with so many modern machines and such good techniques? Well, it does have an impact on the eye. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you cannot. So this whole journey for us uh, started in about 2010 when we did a randomized clinical trial and we looked at two groups of patients, one who, where we used a flow rate of 40 cc per minute with a matching bottle height of 110 centimeters to compensate for that flow. The other group where we used a flow rate of 20 cc per minute and a bottle height of 90 centimeters. And we wanted to look at early post-operative outcomes, particularly on day one and week one, in terms of inflammation and corneal edema, as well as central corneal thickness. So what we found to our surprise is that although none of the eyes really had any major complications in terms of a PCR or others, but yes, when we looked at corneal edema, when we looked at anterior chamber tranquility, they were much better when we used the lower parameters. So that made us thinking that yes, if, if you can do a safe and yet efficient surgery using lower flow rate and lower bottle height, why not? And then we moved on to uh, actually measuring real-time intraocular pressure in the anterior chamber while we were performing surgery. And after a series of several permutations and combinations, we used uh, a setup, which I'll subsequently come to. But what we published in 2014 we found that again, when we use a higher flow rate uh, of 40 cc per minute and a bottle height of 110, which is very standard for most of us, uh, the intraoperative IOP went up to 85 millimeters of mercury. Now, just to imagine if this goes on even for a minute or plus 85 millimeter in any eye, 
but particularly in a, either it is a glaucoma or a vascular compromise. And now post COVID, we are seeing so many vascular post COVID, post vaccination. We really don't know what's going on with the cardiovascular system. So I think this post COVID era presents to us one more opportunity to very closely refine whatever we are doing. And again, we found that these eyes where we used a higher flow rate and a higher bottle height had more uh, anterior segment inflammation and more corneal edema on day one. So this is a setup that was actually used. And uh, th this is an IOP sensor, which goes through a 1.25 millimeter paracentesis that was created limberly. And an inline blood pressure monitor system was used along with the specialized software. So therefore, we could actually uh, overlay the video, what we were doing, which phase of surgery was going on with a trace of the actual intraocular pressure that is going on. And I'll show you a video here. Now here you can see that the irrigation pressure is 84. That means the bottle height is about, let's say 70 or 75 centimeters. And we are working at a 20, cent, a 20 cc per minute flow rate. The fragment is being removed as you can see here. And uh, this white trace if, uh, is the intraocular pressure. Now you may not be able to actually see the figures but this is 40 millimeters and this is 60 millimeters of mercury. And you can see that with a 20 cc flow rate and about 75 bottle height, the pressure remains somewhere between 40 to 45 on an average. And you don't see too many bumps in this graph. It's not that bad. It's pretty smooth. And the whole procedure, you don't see any clinical surges as well. The ultrasound that is being used here is torsional on a continuous mode and it is about 70% preset. Now the same thing, uh, you can see the sensor which is actually measuring the IOP. We will move on to another situation where the bottle height has been stepped up to 110, which translates to an irrigation pressure of about 120. The flow rate is 40 cc per minute. And again, this is 60 millimeters, my cursor, and this is 80 millimeters of mercury. And you can actually at this point see that the pressure is at 80. But what I want you to notice as the video will start playing is these up and down fluctuations that are happening much more. So we can see even on the video that the fragment is really disappearing a little faster, yes, but compared to the previous one, maybe a little less controlled, it tends to fly around. But what we really want to focus is on these fluctuations from about 50 millimeters of mercury to 80 millimeters and a maximum of 80, which keeps happening during a surgery. So again, to recap, if you see both videos put together, 40 cc flow rate, 110, much more fluctuations compared to 20 cc per minute flow rate and a 70 or 80 bottle height, you see much more tranquility. Yes, maybe it takes a few seconds more in terms of time, but I think it looks much more controlled and the eye will definitely be much more forgiving on post-op day one and even maybe in the long term with all these vascular events which we uh, maybe now with the OCT angio and all, we could look at them, but we haven't actually thought of it so much how it is going to impact. So the basic uh, crux is that whatever we input in terms of how much bottle height is going in and how much we take out in terms of leakage, but most importantly, the aspiration flow rate have to balance themselves. Now it goes without saying that if you have a high flow rate, that means if you're taking out more fluid per minute, obviously we will have to compensate it by putting the bottle height much higher. And which is usually what we all do. I mean, we for gravity fluidics, we have a pole and nobody really, most of the times we don't tend to change it. It's there at one high level, irrespective of what stage of surgery we are in. So I think the whole idea for my presentation is just to think that whatever we do is causing an IOP much higher than what we would expect. Here we are fighting for 15, 16, 18 millimeters of mercury. So we need to be conscious of this. Another very startling uh, thing which we found in our cadaver eye studies in a B scan and which we have subsequently published uh, and where we acknowledge the help of all our team at Raghudipai Hospital is these uh, ultrasound B-scan experiments. Now, before I start playing the video, I just want to orient everybody that this is an eye, cadaver eye, where FACO is being performed and simultaneously on that eye, an ultrasound B-scan is placed. 
the anterior uh, the space between the posterior capsule which is this cursor i'm showing and the anterior vitreous space that is the burgess space has been filled with triamcinolone it was dissected manually under the operating microscope and in that space we have injected triamcinolone because we all know that triamcinolone stains the vitreous now you can see this crescentic space here which is completely intact that means the posterior capsule is intact the vitreous space is intact this is the anterior chamber and now we are starting to perform phaco and we can see that as soon as we go to foot pedal 1 the whole thing gets pushed back and when we go to 0 it comes up so there is a lot of trampolining happening here and you can see here that the bottle height is being raised and the flow rate is simultaneously also being raised to 40 cc per minute and we will see that the amplitude of these fluctuations from 0 to 1 this is foot position 0 to foot position 1 is tremendously higher and suddenly we start seeing these echoes in the vitreous cavity which were not there now clinically the uh, posterior capsule is intact there is no posterior capsule rupture because we were doing this on a microscope and but this uh, led us to understand that the anterior vitreous phase which we feel only ruptures when there is a mechanical trauma to it may not be true so we found and this has been corroborated by some mri studies uh, again on experimental lies that in the presence of an intact posterior capsule the anterior vitreous phase can rupture when your pressure inside the anterior chamber becomes very high this is very very important for all of us to understand because all the inflammatory mediators even infectious agents anything can be uh, passing on from the anterior to posterior segment and you are actually breaking the barrier in that sense just by raising your pressure so i think it's very important for us to understand to think about and now move on and start monitoring and if possible even control this pressure which is what i think uh, the subsequent talk will be about uh, about active fluidics and i think with this i would like to end my talk and we are open to questions or discussion based on what time permits yeah i think uh, 